Okay, we're going to get started now. So let me introduce myself. I'm Pete Beckman. Uh, I lead a uh, institute uh, between Argonne National Lab and Northwestern University. Uh, I have been the former director of the Supercomputer Center at Argonne, the ALCF, and I lead some of the extreme computing and system software pieces at Argonne, uh, as well as a sensor project uh, that's deploying sensors in Chicago. Um, so I'm going to get you started with a, an overview of uh, the architecture track, but really an overview of the entire uh, uh, you know, week and a half that you're here. So, uh, so let's get started. Uh, the first thing I wanted to talk about uh, as we get started here is sort of uh, the, the best way for this uh, course to work. Um, so I don't know if you've ever, I don't, how many here are, are hikers, backpackers, uh, you know, kayakers, uh, something like that? All right, great. But, you know, in general, scientists tend to be uh, people uh, who try different things out, whether it's outdoors or something else. And one of the things that you might notice is that a lot of people, uh, even in the conference center here, they, they walk around uh, like this. Okay? And one of the great things, if you finally get far enough away from civilization, is you end up on a trail where there's no signal. And you don't look down, you can't look down, you look up, and you look at the mountains, you look at what's happening. And I'm going to ask you for something. I'm going to ask you to, for this week and a half, to turn off your email, your messaging, all of those things, look up at the speaker, and engage, because the people that you're going to meet in this next sort of week and a half, these are amazing world-class people, people who have invented computer chips, people who have redefined computing. Uh, I'll show you some of the pictures of some of these folks who worked at Argonne, but uh, it is hard to imagine meeting a more respected community in high-performance computing than you will the next week and a half. And so skip the email, do it at the breaks, do it at night, the messaging, the texting, and really just engage. Soak up as much as you can. Uh, this is the very first computer that Argonne had. It comes from back in 1953, I believe. Uh, um, this is Gene Hall, one of the computer scientists who was working on it. They built this in the physics division. This is back when physicists built computers, although at Fermi, I guess they still do. Uh, and, uh, uh, and it was you know, tube-based, and it was about $250,000. And the lab, very shortly after that, decided, hey, we really need to dive in to computing. And we're going to make a division just for computing. You know, computing started out sort of in math divisions in most places, in universities. It was part of the mathematics department. And there are some pretty famous people in this shot from 1983. So first off is uh, right here is Paul Messina. So he was the division director, and he now leads the exascale computing project for the nation. So he has gone from a small division here at uh, Argonne National Laboratory to running the, the uh, premier exascale computing initiative uh, for the nation. We also have other people you might recognize. Does anybody know who that is? Go ahead, say it if you think you know who it is right here. He's speaking later. That's Jack Dungara. So you probably have seen the top 500 list. You know, So back then, he was like a postdoc. Right, uh, working on things. Also in this picture, among others, is Rusty Lusk. Uh, you'll probably see him somewhere around, worked on MPI. Uh, so this idea that parallel computing uh, is, the, is the future, that, uh, that we really need to uh, work on parallel computing, started even back in 83. But one of the problems that large-scale computing started was that uh, um, it is very difficult to port and construct large scientific applications because they outlive the machine. And so this paradox that a machine, a really big machine, only lasts three or four years, and the computer code that you write probably lasts 10 years or more, this means that you have to sink a lot of effort into the abstractions, into understanding how to build those codes. And you're here this week because that is a key part of the training here, is not just 
learning stuff, but stepping back to think about the model. So I really want everyone here in every course, in every session, to, yes, you're learning code, you're learning hands-on. Okay, back up one. What is the model? What is my takeaway message for these concepts that I'm learning? And I'm going to give you a couple examples as we move forward about that model change, especially as it relates to high-performance computing. Now, I wanted to point out that things are in flux. So for about 15 years, honestly, for fi about 15, even maybe 20 years, high-performance computing didn't change much. You know, we got new machines, we got faster machines, we got bigger machines, but it was really all about scaling, the interconnect, and on-node performance. And you just kept scaling and doing that over and over and over for 15 years. Several years ago, I gave a talk here at ATP ESC. It was a dinner talk, it was in 2014, and I said, hey, you know, the future is coming. We're starting to change architectures in a very unique way, and we will have on package memory, and we'll start to have to program package memory, package memory that's on the device, and then there's going to be memory off the device, and then there'll be NVRAM, and you'll have a memory hierarchy. And now that is exactly the machine we have here at Argon and at NERSC and other places. It is happening everywhere that there's on package memory and there's off package, and then finally NVRAM. So the moral of the story here is that. Years ago, there were many things that the programmer could assume and write into their code and just sort of believe, hey, I don't have to, I don't have to make an abstraction or address that. That's always going to be the case. There will always be memory. I malloc it, and the cache takes care of accessing it fast. That abstraction is gone, right? Now we have hierarchical memory. We have ways that we have to look at the memory in a new, in a new light. Okay, now I'm going to point out a couple other things that are changing our world with respect to our notion of heterogeneity of a computer. You may have seen this, and we're going to have a speaker from IBM later who's going to be talking about quantum computing. This is the first time in the series, five years we've been doing this series, that we've decided to put a quantum computing talk in the program because we're really on the edge of disruption, of completely changing how we do computing not necessarily all computing, but some computing. You're going to hear about that. But the companies are lining up to compete. Google, IBM, there are probably 15 companies now that are lining up saying, hey, we are about ready for something that they refer to as supremacy, quantum supremacy, when they can calculate stuff that classic computers just simply can't calculate. So we have the standard computer that we've been using for 15, 20 years. We have quantum computing really close, and we'll hear how close when, uh, when Chris speaks later. We also have the fact that special purpose cores, special purpose hardware is happening as well. FPGAs are beginning to become more prevalent. Intel spent billions and bought an FPGA company specifically so that they can marry FPGAs onto their cores, onto their chips. So how many here have programmed FPGAs? OK, a couple, three maybe, that I've seen. right? So this is, again, discussion about abstractions. You're, we're moving to the place where your code base has to not only be able to do OpenMP, but you have to start thinking about, how could I make a function? It's not here yet. We don't have uh, uh, big computers. There are computers out there that have FPGAs married in. But we don't have big computers yet ready to do that. But it's already because the code lasts so long. Code lasts 10 years. You have to start imagining that in your, in your code. Another example is machine learning hardware. And again, this is being driven tremendously by uh, the, the uh, commercial world. So over here on the right, there are companies like Google who have been investing in a processor that accelerates TensorFlow, which is one of their deep learning frameworks. Right? And so they have a, a piece of hardware that accelerates it 10, 15, even more times. And they can run TensorFlow on the server faster. 
Fujitsu is not to be outdone. They are working on a chip that will be released in about 2018, uh, 2018 called their Deep Learning Unit. Uh, and then on the complete other side, so that's the server side, on the other side there are companies working on machine learning hardware at the edge. So these are very small, lightweight, just a handful of watts uh, hardware that is used in everything from drones that can recognize your face and recognize gesture uh, to sensors like are deployed in Chicago. And so you haven't, how many here have written uh, code for a hardware, I'm going to ask a question, hardware accelerator for deep learning? Nobody yet. Well, maybe, maybe one. How many have already started working in, in machine learning of some sort, whether it's CAFE, TensorFlow, others? Right. Again, my point here is the abstraction. So we'll be moving into a space in hardware where these will become common and will be in supercomputers of the future. So understanding the machine learning section later in this week or next week is really about making sure that you have that right code base and understand things so that when this hardware is made available commercially and you just run your code on it, you're ready. I'm going to mention one more tech piece and then we're going to sum up here and get ready for uh, answer some questions. This is from a PhD student uh, uh, at UIUC who is uh, defending her PhD in uh, about a month and a half. And this was a very simple experiment she ran on several computers, which was to understand the variability of the processors. In other words, just on a single machine, how fast do some processors run compared to other processors? And she made a simple histogram. You can see here that each machine has a different breadth, a different span of how fast and how slow their processors run. Now, almost all scientific code today, not all, but I would say at least 70% of scientific code today has this notion of equal work is equal time. That means that the way you write a parallel program is you divide up your work into equally sized chunks, you send each equally sized chunk to a CPU, and then when they're all done with their equally sized chunks, you move on to the next iteration, the next time step, and so forth, right? How many people here, you know, that's, their, that's your code, equal work is equal time? Okay. That's everybody, not quite everybody, right? All right, so this says that doesn't work very well. That the future of computing, and actually this breadth is getting worse every year. It's not getting better. This is because of the way we make silicon and the way processors are being built for the future that equal work is not equal time. So let me wrap up here and then we'll have time for questions. I'm going to make some recommendations of this week and the uh, following week for things for you to start thinking about to where you should be investing. So number one, always other people's math libraries. It's, it, I'm, I'm always surprised when people write their own sparse matrix package, all right? Don't do that, okay? Someone else has written a sparse matrix package. You should just find it. Um, encapsulation, messaging, and parallelism, all of those abstractions I just talked about. Embedding capabilities in your code from the beginning. You're going to hear from people who are going to be talking about debugging, performance tuning, correctness, uh, resilience. Putting those things in from the beginning as a, in your framework, not writing your code first and then trying to figure out how to add performance tuning and debugging will really help you out. The two workflow views. So one is the science workflow, how you set up the problem, how you analyze it. The other is the programmer workflow modification, testing, documentation, committing, that loop. And you've got to keep both of those, the science workflow and the programmer workflow, synchronized and well understood and well documented. Automation is great. A really A-plus build system, that goes a long way to being able to spend time on the physics and on the chemistry and on the math instead of chasing problems down in the software. And of course, all of the stuff that you guys already know about, GitHub and uh, bug tracking and email and so forth. So let me wrap up and say that there are three big areas that as you look forward in hardware and software that you should keep right in the front of your head, right? One is the memory is now a hierarchy. It is less flat, 
right? The cache kind of hid its part, right? But now it's right out in the open. There's on-package memory, there's off-package memory, there's NVRAM, and there's gonna be more, more layers. And it's because of how power uh, is uh, in limited supply on a machine. The second is heterogeneity. Now, it's not likely you're, you'll buy your next Mac with a quantum coprocessor, um, but it, it will happen at some point, right? And as soon as uh, they get past some of the physical impediments, like uh, you know, any sort of uh, R, stray RF or uh, temperature variations cause problems, but you can imagine in the future quantum being part of scientific computer, scientific computing toolbox. So quantum, FPGA, uh, machine learning hardware. So understanding your code and how you will handle that heterogeneity is key. And finally, this performance variability. The machine is not equal work is equal time, and it, it's getting worse over time. So how you handle that and how you plan to handle that will be very important. Okay, so our next speaker, right, Scott, uh, and uh, um, while uh, Scott is coming up, um, does anybody have any questions? We have, we have time for a bit. So you mentioned about uh, this increasing, you know, it you talked about the histogram and the variability in the speed. Yeah. So how do we know about it a priori? Like when we are submitting a code to run. Great, great question. One of the questions is, with this performance variability, what do you do? How do you know about it a priori? So I'll say two answers. One is that there are some things that happen that the system can sort and decide which, co which nodes are faster and which nodes are slower. And there are projects that have been working to do that. A second way, again, behind the scenes that you don't see, is there are people who have been working on adjusting electrical power to kind of try and balance those things by adjusting the power uh, um, to these nodes. But the third thing is one that you have to write into your code which is that you should assume variability, and as part of that performance monitoring, get back in your code, where did I go wrong with respect to equal work is equal time? How late did processors arrive? And that way, when you run your code, you know if there's a problem. You, I can't tell you how many times people dive into debugging not realizing that, gee, it's just one processor uh, arriving late. So that needs to be something we write into our code. And uh, um, we have to follow me, get me at the break because we got to start uh, with Scott. So go ahead.